Why are you here? On my way home, when I passed through a deserted park, I heard a cat-like cry from the trash bin. I thought someone had played a prank and got stuck inside, so I peeked in. There was my three-month-old daughter. She was supposed to be home with my husband. In a panic, I called him, and he calmly lied. Our daughter is napping. I couldn't believe he would abandon our own child. Furious, I decided to make my husband suffer the same fate. I am Mary, 30 years old. At my workplace, I was courted by John, the son of the company president. We got married just three months later, and I became a housewife to support him. During our courtship and early marriage, John was very kind. My parents-in-law also blessed us, and I was living happily every day. However, as time went by, John's true nature, which I hadn't seen during our courtship, began to emerge. About half a year after getting married, I happily became pregnant. Since John and I had talked about wanting a child soon, I immediately shared the news. John said, Really? Yes. It must be a boy. I replied, We don't know yet, but as long as the baby is healthy, either gender is fine. John insisted, No, our child is definitely a boy. Despite my reservations, he was thrilled about the pregnancy. From then on, John took it upon himself to inform our parents and colleagues that we were having a son. He even assumed the baby's name would be male and started buying boys' clothes. His unwavering belief became more pronounced. I worried. Is John really okay with this uncertainty? Months later, during a prenatal checkup, we finally learned the baby's gender. I hesitantly told John. Um, the baby is a girl. His reaction shocked me. What? Why a girl? I wanted a boy. I explained that we couldn't choose the gender, but she was healthy and would surely be adorable. John retorted. I don't care. It's because you didn't take proper care of yourself that it's not a boy. I was taken aback. I'd never heard that my lifestyle affected the baby's gender. John's unreasonable blame left me speechless. Despite my efforts, I couldn't argue with his absurd reasoning. Would he love our daughter when she was born? For the first time, I felt anxious about our life together. Since learning our child was a girl, John's attitude toward me grew noticeably colder. Today is the day to buy baby supplies. Remember? I reminded him. His response. I'm not in the mood, so I won't go. I sighed. This wasn't the first time he'd canceled plans related to our child. When he thought it was a boy, he eagerly prepared everything. Now that it's a girl, his motivation seems non-existent. In the evening, John finally returned home. I'm back. I'm starving. Is dinner ready? It'll take a little more time, so please be patient. Despite repeatedly breaking promises, John acted nonchalant. Annoyed, I couldn't help but respond in an irritable tone. What's with that attitude? It's nothing. You're so cheeky. Whose money do you think supports our life? Frustrated, John pushed me on the shoulder. Ouch! I never thought I would be subjected to violence. With my growing belly making balance difficult, I stumbled and fell backward. I never imagined he'd shove a pregnant woman. Shocked by his actions, 
I felt pain in my lower back and tightening in my abdomen. I instinctively clutched my belly and sank to the floor. Ouch, my belly! I'm sorry. Work has been stressful lately, and I lost control. I won't do it again. Perhaps seeing my distress, John hurried over, helped me up, and guided me to the sofa. He brewed a warm drink and brought a blanket. It was the first time in a while that he'd been so kind. Thank you, I'm okay, now. Seeing John's concern, I wondered if stress was the cause of his behavior. I decided to forgive him. Some time later, I safely gave birth to a lovely baby girl. I named her Helen. She grew up healthy and lively. As I'd feared during pregnancy, John remained indifferent to our daughter. Despite my disappointment, I hoped that fatherly instincts would eventually awaken in him. One day, while struggling with parenting Helen, I received a call from my mother. She had been in an accident and was injured, requiring hospitalization. Since my father's passing, she had been living alone without any reliable relatives nearby. Although her life wasn't in immediate danger, I worried and decided to visit her. However, our family home was far away, and the journey would take a full day. I hesitated to take three-month-old Helen with me. When I informed John that I was going to visit my mother, he responded with an indifferent, hmm, and showed no interest in coming along. Despite my concerns about leaving Helen, I had no other option but to entrust her care to him. Please follow the instructions for preparing the formula exactly as I showed you. If you're unsure, I've left notes, so make sure to check. John replied. I'll manage for a day. You better hurry, you'll miss the train. Reluctantly, he agreed to take care of Helen during my absence. Initially, he wore a displeased expression, but after repeated requests for his cooperation in parenting, he seemed to understand. He even made an effort to learn about feeding and diaper changes. Perhaps this was an opportunity for John to grow as a father. On the morning of my departure, I left with hopeful expectations, torn between my responsibilities and my longing to see my mother. After a long journey, I safely reunited with her. She appeared more spirited than I had anticipated. With hospital arrangements settled, I stayed overnight at my childhood home. The next day, I had planned to spend the morning with my mother before returning. However, she called early, suggesting I come back sooner for Helen's sake. Worried about our child, I had initially told John I'd return in the evening. But I changed my plans, opting to take the first train home. As a result, I arrived at our nearest station well ahead of schedule, eager to see Helen. I walked briskly toward home. Wait, what's that sound? Along the path from the station to our house, there was a sparsely populated park. As I passed through, I heard something resembling a baby's cry. I glanced around, but there was no one else, no parents with children or anyone else nearby. It must be my imagination, a baby wouldn't be here. Perhaps it was just a kitten's mewing. Despite my rationalization, curiosity got the better of me, and I entered the park to investigate. As I walked, guided by the sound, it seemed that the cries were coming from inside a trash bin. Perhaps someone had played a prank, trapping a creature inside. Feeling sorry for it, I opened the lid to rescue whatever was stuck. But to my surprise, it wasn't a cat, it was Helen. What? Why is she here? I exclaimed. There she was, my daughter, Helen. Panic surged through me, 
but I quickly lifted her out of the trash bin. Helen cried intensely, but as I held her, she gradually calmed down. She looked at me and even managed a little smile. Relieved by her well-being, I sighed. But how could this be? Helen was supposed to be home with John. I hurriedly called John. Hello. Um. How's Helen? John replied nonchalantly. Oh, she's napping, so no problem. I couldn't believe his obvious lie. Still, I managed a response and hung up. John likely had no idea I'd changed my plans and was already near home. He thought Helen's situation wouldn't be discovered, so he lied to me. Hearing his words, my trust and affection for him crumbled audibly. John had always wanted a son. Since Helen's birth, I hadn't seen him show any affection toward her. I hoped fatherly instincts would eventually emerge but it seemed my wish fell on deaf ears. How could he abandon his daughter like this? Unforgivable. I resolved to seek revenge against John for subjecting my precious daughter to such cruelty. For now, what should I do? Taking Helen back to John's house was risky. After careful consideration, I decided to take her in a taxi to a certain location. As night fell, I returned home according to my original schedule. When I opened the front door, John came running from the back of the room, looking frantic. It's terrible! I accidentally fell asleep, and Helen is gone! She must have been kidnapped! That's serious! Let's call the police right away! I decided to play along with his story. The police? Isn't it too early for that? My mention of the police visibly unsettled him. Ignoring his reaction, I pretended to report the situation on my phone. John panicked and knocked the phone out of my hand. His face contorted, and he was breathing heavily. I steeled myself and got to the heart of the matter. Actually, did you take Helen somewhere? What? You suspect me? But Helen might have been abducted, and you haven't even contacted the police. Doesn't that seem strange? Caught off guard, John couldn't come up with an excuse. He became defensive. I did it to test your trust in me. Just as I thought... You don't believe in me. He started blaming me with intense anger. What? You don't understand? And what does Helen have to do with this? Tell me, where did you take her? As I glared at him, John softened his angry expression and smirked. Ha ha ha, too bad. Your precious Helen is in the park's trash bin. What? Are you insane? Of course. By now, she's probably been taken far away or become crow food. That's cruel. Is this how a father behaves? Enough. It's your fault for not giving birth to the son I wanted. You've embarrassed me. John admitted to being the culprit but continued to shift blame onto me. He had done something outrageous and was now trying to pin it on someone else. I couldn't contain my rage at his ugly behavior. I'm going to the police! Oof. Go ahead if you can. You're the one in trouble, Mary. As a stay-at-home wife, how will you survive without me? That's irrelevant. I can't continue with someone who subjected my precious Helen to this. Well, it's your fault for not giving birth to the heir my parents expected. You've let them down and brought shame upon me. 
John's selfish behavior left me dumbfounded. He said, Listen, you only need to do what I say. Forget about Helen and quickly give birth to the next boy. With a smug expression, he laughed at me, and I glared back in frustration. Then, the front door opened. Standing there were my in-laws, holding Helen. John's eyes widened in shock as he saw the parents he hadn't expected and the daughter he thought he'd abandoned. He nervously wiped his forehead, sweating. The truth was, after ending the call with John at the park where I found Helen, I took a taxi to my in-law's house. I happened to find Helen and rescued her. I've already informed your parents about this incident. I explained to him. His parents had heard John's verbal slip outside. My father-in-law shouted at John. How could you abandon your own child like that? John stammered, unable to come up with an excuse. My father-in-law continued. You were fixated on having a male heir, but just being a boy doesn't guarantee succession. You're fired. John tried to protest, but my father-in-law wasn't swayed. We'll also nullify any talk of you being the next company president. Our family ties are severed, so don't come to us again. John, who had always been confident and boastful at work, couldn't defy my strict father-in-law. John trembled and shed tears. I said, Since I'm the leaseholder of this apartment, get out now. John pleaded. Wait, Mary, are you really abandoning me too? Despite losing his job and being rejected by my in-laws, he desperately apologized. Please forgive me. I'll properly care for Helen from now on. What? Now you say that? You abandoned your own child, and just because she's not a boy? I messed up, but I don't need to obsess over an heir anymore. It's fine. And, uh, I'll take care of parenting from now on, so you can work outside. Don't belittle me. I'll never forgive you. I never want to see your face again. I looked down at John and delivered my cold response. His last hope shattered, and he sobbed. Despite some resistance, my in-laws pressured him, and he eventually packed his belongings, shoulders slumped, and left. Our divorce was finalized. I claimed $20,000 in alimony and $100,000 in child support from John. My in-laws covered the payments up front, and John, now jobless and abandoned by his parents, lives in a rundown apartment, working tirelessly at a physical labor job day and night. As for Helen and me, we return to my hometown where my mother lives. We live happily with my recovered mother and our adorable daughter. We maintain a relationship with my in-laws, and Helen is thrilled when they visit. Together, we shower Helen with love and ensure her happiness. How did you like this story? If you enjoyed it, consider subscribing to our channel. Until next time. My name is Vanessa. I am a 38-year-old housewife and work as an illustrator. My husband, Randall, and I have been together since high school and finally got married at the age of 33 after 16 years of dating. He is a lawyer, and it's been five years since he established his own law firm. The firm has grown significantly, thanks to word-of-mouth referrals from clients, and he now has staff working for him. Two years ago, after both our careers had settled down, we began trying to conceive, and we are now expecting a child. I am very happy. One day, I received a phone call during this happy time. Long time no see, sis. Are you and Randall free this Saturday? I have someone I want to introduce to you. I'm free, 
but I'll have to check with Randall when he gets home. Who do you want to introduce? Oh, stop it. Just wait until then. It's a surprise. Cameron is my younger brother, ten years my junior. To me, he's like my own child. Our parents passed away when I was in my third year of high school. Our father, a firefighter, drowned while rescuing a child from a river near our home. The incident was so sudden that our mother weakened mentally and physically, and soon after, she also passed away. I decided to forego university, which I had just been accepted into, to work and raise Cameron until he became a responsible adult. I never imagined the day would come when he would want to introduce someone to me. Randall had a break from work that weekend and made time for Cameron. I was looking forward to that day. Finally, Saturday arrived. Cameron was supposed to come around 11 a.m. We planned to chat at home before going out to a nearby restaurant for lunch. Right on time, Cameron arrived at our home. Hey, sis. Long time no see. How have you been? Welcome. Haven't you grown a bit since last time? We exchanged pleasantries, and then a petite woman peeked from behind him, bowing slightly. So, the person you wanted to introduce is this lovely lady? Yes. Let me introduce you. This is my fiancé, Leah. Nice to meet you. I'm Cameron's sister. Come on in, no need to stand at the door. Randall and I exchanged glances, surprised by the name Cameron introduced. Leah seemed like a cute, modern young woman, with flashy nails and piercings. She bowed again and followed Cameron into the living room. Let me formally introduce you. This is my fiancé, Leah. Isn't she cute? Nice to meet you. I'm Leah. It's a pleasure. We greeted each other in the living room, but Leah, perhaps because she was shy, didn't talk much. Instead, she avoided eye contact with me, glancing around the room as if she were inspecting it. Nice to meet you. Again, I'm Cameron's sister, Vanessa. And this is my husband, Randall. Nice to meet you. Cameron told me he had a cute girlfriend, and he was right. Oh, was that inappropriate? Sorry. Randall, worried that he might have said too much, inadvertently lightened the atmosphere with his words, and the conversation continued with smiles. Oh, thank you. Leah, how old are you? Where did you meet Cameron? I'm 22. We met at a dinner party. I see. So young. I'm envious. At 40, I couldn't help but feel envious of Leah's youth. I wonder what I was doing at 22. Though I had no regrets, it was a time of both fun and hardship. As I reminisced about my past, Randall spoke up. That sounds nice. I wish I could have gone to such parties. He sighed with a smile. Randall, you were always supporting my sister who was working so hard. I really appreciate it. Hearing this, Leah leaned forward and spoke to me. Vanessa, when did you start working? Right after graduating high school. I was working in a factory when I was around your age. After high school, I was assigned a job by the Career Guidance Office and worked at a factory for 14 years until Cameron graduated from university. Leah looked at me with pity in her eyes. You must have had a tough time. Working non-stop without going to university. Hearing this, Cameron, 
who had been enjoying the conversation, now looked downcast. I told Cameron, I don't want you to think it was your fault. It wasn't really tough, I had fun. I might have entered the adult world a bit earlier than others, but it was interesting. Leah, are you a university student? Yes, I'm planning to submit our marriage registration as soon as I graduate and become a housewife. Hearing this, Cameron lifted his face, and his smile gradually returned, which relieved me. Leah wanted to marry while still a student, but Cameron, being a firefighter, convinced her to wait until she graduated. Leah reluctantly agreed. Her family runs a company, so she's never had to worry about money and has never worked a part-time job. Perhaps because of this, she thinks that women who don't work are the winners in life and seem to pity me for having worked. While I don't think people who work are necessarily superior, I believe work experience is an essential skill for life. I realized that Leah and I had different values, but she's still in her early 20s, so I decided to let it go. Afterward, we went to the reserved restaurant, had various conversations, and enjoyed our meal. Cameron, why is she his choice for a wife? They haven't even been dating for six months, right? After Cameron and Leah left, Randall muttered. Well, the length of time before marriage varies from person to person. As long as Cameron is happy, that's all that matters. But yes, she certainly seemed like a sheltered young lady. Initially, I was simply happy that my little brother was getting married, but Randall's words made me a bit uneasy. Two months passed since Cameron introduced Leah to us, and they were coming over again. This time, they wanted to hand-deliver the wedding invitations. As soon as Cameron entered the living room, he handed me an invitation. The wedding is set for three months from now, in March. Both of you must come. Oh, that's quite soon. I wondered if they could manage such a large event in time. Leah insisted on having the wedding right after graduation. Well, the younger, the cuter, right? I stared at Leah, unable to help myself. Is there something on my face? She looked back at me with a displeased expression. Oh, no. Sorry about that. I was just wondering if you plan to work part-time after getting married? I had been curious about this. What are you talking about? If I worked, I wouldn't be able to take care of the house. Cameron needs to focus on his job, and if we ever need money, my dad is there. Leah's words made it clear that she didn't want to work and planned to rely on her father if necessary. Isn't Leah cute, taking care of me? Love is blind, as they say. Cameron kept boasting about Leah, calling her cute whenever she did anything. I felt a little sad, knowing he would be under her thumb after marriage. Leah often leaned on Cameron, and when Randall and Cameron went out for drinks before, Cameron had bragged. She really depends on me. It's cute when a woman relies on you, right? As a firefighter in a tough, male-dominated environment, Cameron found Leah's dependence refreshing. I nodded at his words. I see. Yes, she is cute. Cameron smiled with satisfaction, while Leah kept her eyes fixed on me. Vanessa, are you pregnant? Yes. I had mentioned my pregnancy when Cameron introduced Leah to us previously. Maybe she was too nervous to remember. Oh, I didn't really listen to your story. How far along are you? She didn't remember, she just hadn't listened. Oh, I see. I'm five months along. 
my belly will be quite noticeable at the wedding, but I'll be there. You don't have to come if you don't want to. Wait, does she dislike me? As I pondered this, feeling a bit sensitive. Leah, what are you saying? Vanessa and Randall must come. They are like my parents. Cameron, not in his usual gentle tone, but a lower voice, told Leah. Leah, hearing this, shook and quickly corrected herself. No, I mean, don't push yourself if it's hard. I was just worried about your health. Hearing this, Cameron nodded, seemingly satisfied. Oh, I see. You were concerned about her. However, I thought. No, she genuinely doesn't want me there for some reason. After that, Leah called me once a week to say, Vanessa, how are you feeling? If it's really tough, you don't have to come. Actually, if you feel even a little bit off, please don't come. I kept wondering what I had done to Leah, but I couldn't find an answer. Since she seemed to get along well with Cameron, I didn't want to worry my brother about it, so I only consulted Randall, asking him not to tell Cameron. Time passed, and the day of the wedding arrived. As planned, Randall and I headed to their wedding. The ceremony went smoothly, and I was so moved that I cried. Randall, who held my hand and led me to the reception hall, was surprised. Your seat is the only one not prepared. What? Why? I wiped my tears in shock and told the staff. Excuse me, I'm Cameron's sister, but I can't seem to find my seat. The staff, flustered, replied. Please wait a moment. After checking, they apologized and told me that my seat was indeed missing. Why? Isn't it a mistake? I have a seat, but his real sister doesn't. As the staff was at a loss, Leah appeared from behind, laughing loudly. You don't have a seat. Go home. Why is this happening? Can you explain? I kindly warned you not to come, but you showed up anyway, so this is what you get. I might have asked before, but did I do something to you? Yes, because an old woman like you is pregnant. What? What do you mean? I couldn't understand at all. Indeed, I was having a late pregnancy. But how did that inconvenience Leah? Apparently, Cameron often talked about our baby at home, saying, I hope my sister has a healthy baby. If you have a baby, Cameron will stop paying attention to me. Even the money he used to spend on me has stopped since you got pregnant. Don't get cocky just because you're a poor, high school educated old woman. I was stunned. What was she saying? Fearing Cameron's interest would shift to my baby was pure paranoia. And as for the money, I didn't understand why she was blaming me. While I was contemplating a response, Leah pushed me, saying, No matter how much you insist, there's no seat. Go home. Fortunately, Randall caught me before I fell and hurt my back. Realizing that staying here was dangerous, I said, Fine. I'll go but don't regret it. What are you mumbling about? I won't regret it. Just leave. I sent Cameron a message. Sorry, I'm leaving today. I'll talk to you properly another time. Enjoy today. As I was about to leave, I heard Cameron's voice from behind. Leah, how many times do I have to tell you? I spent all my savings on this wedding because it was expensive. That's why I can't buy what you want. That's obviously a lie. 
You're a public servant. You must have money. Always talking about your sister. Are you a sister complex or what? You just want to spend money on your poor sister's baby. Leah wasn't listening to Cameron at all. Then, a new figure appeared. What's all this commotion? Dad, listen. Because of her pregnancy, Cameron is neglecting me. When Leah's father looked in my direction, he was shocked. What? You? This person? Hello. I greeted him with a smile. Are you Cameron's sister? Yes, it seems you have no interest in the family of your daughter's fiancé. In fact, I had a business relationship with Leah's father. However, Leah's parents had declined a family meeting because I had no parents. I knew about her parents, but Leah's father seemed indifferent to his daughter's fiancé's family. So what if this old woman is Cameron's sister? This person is supposed to exclusively write essays for our company in the future. So what? Didn't you say high school graduates are incompetent, Dad? No, Vanessa's essays are quite popular and she's very talented. Several companies wanted to sign her, but recently she decided to contract with our company. That's right. Since you are my brother's future in-laws, I thought I'd work with you. But even someone as incompetent as me can tell it's better not to contract with a company that mocks people. So, let's consider the contract null and void. No, this is a misunderstanding. I didn't realize Cameron's sister was such a talented person. I graduated high school and started working right away to raise Cameron into a fine adult. Thanks to that, he grew into a respectable young man. Now, I'm a self-taught illustrator. Education doesn't matter. Besides, I'm not poor. While working at the factory, I also drew illustrations as a hobby. Posting these on my blog brought in some income, allowing me to quit the factory and become a full-time illustrator. Over the years, several publishers approached me to turn my blog into a book. Leah's father tried to make amends, fearing the loss of our contract, but Randall intervened. Please stop for my wife's health. Just then. It's almost time. The staff had come to fetch Leah to change into her reception dress, but Cameron replied. Cancel the reception. Inform the guests it's now just a dinner. Hearing this, Leah screamed. What? Why? I was about to wear a beautiful dress. Cameron had decided not to marry Leah. After hearing your conversation, I realized you just want my money. You're taking it out on my sister because you're not getting your way. I can't be with someone who throws hysterics when things don't go their way. Cameron explained calmly, pushed the clinging Leah away, and went to the reception hall to explain the situation. As they had planned to submit their marriage registration after the ceremony, it ended as an engagement cancellation. Since Leah caused the cancellation, she was responsible for all the fees. Cameron later told me the sudden wedding with many added options cost at least $100,000, not including the honeymoon. Leah had to cover these costs herself since her parents were also in trouble, working day and night to pay off the debt. Meanwhile, I safely gave birth to a daughter. Though recovery took some time, Seeing my daughter's sleeping face filled me with happiness. Cameron dotes on his niece and visits every weekend, competing with Randall for her attention. I hope he finds a good partner soon. How was today's story? Don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you in the next video.